What are these children looking so serious about? They're playing karuta. Scenes like this are associated with the new year in Japan. Karuta are traditional card games that people of all ages have enjoyed for centuries. It's a distinctly Japanese cultural mix between games played by court nobles in ancient Japan and card games introduced from Europe. Karata cards are appreciated as objects of beauty. They're used to educate and cultivate. And they pit players against each other, matching wits and reflexes in competitive games. Each card reflects aspects of Japanese craftsmanship and creativity. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at Karuta, the classic card games that showcase Japan's more playful side. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today we're going to be taking a look at an indispensable part of the traditional Japanese New Year's celebrations, karta. It's not actually a Japanese word, it comes from the Portuguese karta, which means a card in English, of course, and it refers to Japanese traditional playing cards. If you look at this one here, you'll see that it doesn't have any numbers on it. It does have a picture of a princess and some writing, which is a poem, but we'll get into some more detail later on. If you look at this table in front of me here, you'll see there's a pretty wide variety of different types of karta. First of all, let's take a look at what they're all about. In Japan, the new year is marked by karuta events all around the country. For centuries, karuta games have been a familiar and much-loved amusement among friends and families. Karuta are playing cards with pictures and words on them. There are three main types. First, uta karuta, or poem cards. They're designed to help people memorize the Japanese classics. The cards feature waka poems composed by ancient poets. It's a fun way to get to know Japanese poetry. The most widely played version of Uta Karuta is called Ogura Hyakunin Ishu. Hyakunin Ishu is a collection of poems, one from each of 100 great poets in Japanese history. The poems deal with subjects like the beauty of the seasons, romantic love, and the joys and sorrows of life. There are two sets of cards, Yomifuda and Torifuda. Waka poems are written on these cards. Each poem consists of 31 syllables arranged in five lines, five, seven, five, seven, and seven syllables in length. The first three lines make up the first part of the poem, and the last two lines the second part. The Yomifuda set contains the first part of each poem, or sometimes the entire poem, along with a picture of the poet. The Torifuda set contains only the second parts of the poems. Basically, the game is played like this. A reciter reads out the Yomifuda, and two players compete to touch the corresponding Torifuda. To win, you have to identify the second part of the poem before your opponent. So it's a big advantage if you already know the poems by heart. The second type of game is called Iroha Karuta, alphabet cards. In this case, there are 48 cards. They're marked with phonetic syllables. The subject is not poems, but traditional maxims and proverbs. But the rules are the same as for Hyakunin Ishu. The Omifuda are red, and the players compete to touch the corresponding Torifuda. Hey! 
The Yomi Fuda has a saying, and on the Tori Fuda is the first syllable of that saying and a picture representing it. In this case, the saying is, proof trumps theories. This saying means, little things add up, so don't neglect them. So, the game of Iroha Karuta combines entertainment with lessons in life. The third type of game is Hanafuda, or flower cards. There are no Yomifuda. All the cards have pictures or motifs of Japanese flora and fauna. There's a particular seasonal flower or plant for each of the 12 months. January is pine, February is plum, March is cherry blossom. There are various ways to play, but the basic idea is to collect the cards into sets that score points. Hanafuda are karuta that reflect the Japanese love of nature's changing beauty through the four seasons. Poetry, and a sense of fun have been important aspects of Japanese culture for centuries. Karuta embody both traditions. Card games around the world are invariably linked with gambling. And back in the Edo period, gambling was so common that the ruling shoguns actually banned card games as being a threat to public morals. So what happened then was that the artisans who make the cards made subtle alterations to their designs to get around the restrictions. And a kind of game of cat and mouse between the authorities and the artisans ensued, in the process of which the designs evolved into what we now know as hanafuda. And I have a set of those here. These are back to four suits and 12 cards in each suit. But as you can see, there are no numerical in designs in the cards at all. Nevertheless, people back in the Edo period knew exactly which numbers were being evoked because all of the cards have designs of um, different plants which would be seasonal at a different time of the year. Let's move on now and take a look at the way that karta are manufactured. Originally, karata were made in stages with different craftsmen providing different skills. A painter would paint the cards. An aristocrat or Buddhist monk would write the calligraphy, and a papermaker would create the cardstock. The combination of these skills produced karata of exceptional artistic merit. Nowadays, karata are made by machines. There are still handmade ones around, but they've become rare. These are hand-printed karata cards. Fabric dyes mixed with paste and alum are used, and the colours are applied through paper stencils. This method was common in the Edo period several centuries ago. For each colour, a different stencil is used. In all, nine colours are applied to the paper. Fabric dyes create vibrant colours, and dyeing with stencils results in images that are not quite perfectly aligned. That gives the cards character. Colour gradations express the beauty of flowers as they're found in nature. The cards have the unique appeal of handmade items. Some karata are made with no expense spared. This workshop in Fushimi, Kyoto, has been operating for 200 years. Here, a centuries-old process is still being used. First, paste is applied to washi paper coated in gold foil. The card is placed in the center 
and promptly pasted down. The protruding edges are folded back to wrap the card. Each card requires a lot of skill and dexterity, not least because the paste dries quickly. Washi paper is what Japanese karata are made of. Centuries ago, there was no technology to make thick paper, so multiple sheets of washi were built up instead. But cards made of layers of paper sometimes came apart when they were used. So the edges were wrapped to make them stronger. This technique protects the character from damage and makes the precious paper more durable. Karata also exhibit a craftsman's decorative skills. Shigeo Fukiyage is an artisan who applies gold leaf decoration to karata. He uses top quality gold leaf, like that used in restoring national treasures and other important cultural properties. The gold foil is laid down over the pictures, but only sticks where paste has been pre-applied. So gold only remains on a fraction of each picture. Shimmering flecks of gold leaf add a touch of opulence to the clothing, and this makes the cards look even more elegant. When I work on these karata, I try to adopt a spirit of tranquility and assume a mindset of dignity and elegance. I hope that is reflected in my work. The tradition of Japanese karata is kept alive by artisans whose superb traditional skills impart a spirit of playfulness. Now here we have a set of Hyakunin Ishu karta, or the poem cards, uh, created at the beginning of the 18th century by a painter called Ogata Korin, who was renowned for establishing a style of elegant splendor. This is actually not the original set, this is a copy of a set that was discovered in the home of an old Kyoto family of over 30 years ago. Even this copied set is actually quite valuable, it's worth about 130,000 yen, which at current exchange rates is about a thousand pounds or so. Now, uh, the cards are divided up into two different sets. These here have the first half of a waka poem and a picture of the poet who composed it. And these here have the second half of the poem and a picture of some scenery or some other element that's associated with the content of the poem. These cards are regarded as one of the masterpieces of Ongata Korin and their extravagance tells you that they were not used just as playthings, but were regarded as art objects in their own right. Now, occasionally, sets of cards like these were created as part of a bride's dowry, the reasoning being that when you put together the two sets of cards with the first half and the second half of the poem, they become a kind of metaphor for marriage. OK, let's move on now and take a look at the history of karta. The roots of karata go back about 1,000 years to the Heian period. In those days, aristocrats of the imperial court enjoyed a pastime called kai oi. Dozens of pairs of clamshells were laid out all mixed up and players tried to match the pairs. A natural property of the shells is that only an original pair will fit together perfectly. After another two or three centuries, the inside of each shell was being elaborately decorated. Kai Oi was the forerunner of karata.
European playing cards were introduced to Japan in the 16th century. By then, Portuguese traders were coming to Japan. The playing cards were brought by sailors on their ships. This painting shows a scene from that period. It depicts foreigners engrossed in a card game. The cards brought by the Portuguese had four suits, rods, swords, cups, and medallions. There were 12 denominations of each, making a total of 48 cards. Japanese cards were subsequently created, based on the Portuguese playing cards. Today, only this single card remains, the oldest known karata in Japan. But the woodblocks used to print those karata do survive, and have been used to make these reproductions. It's clear from the exotic design that the Japanese makers were trying to create an accurate version of the Portuguese originals. Later, the designs were adapted to Japanese tastes and included familiar deities such as Ebisu and Daikokuten. By the 17th century or so, Western style playing cards and Japan's ancient shell matching game had merged to form a distinctly Japanese style of karata. These karata are in the shape of a Japanese folding fan. Their elegant curves give them a unique appeal not found in rectangular ones. Shogi is a traditional Japanese game similar to Western chess. Karata with the five-sided shape of shogi pieces were also made. Another evolution was the addition of classic waka poems to karata that originally only had pictures. Called Uta Karuta, these were used to aid in learning the classics. Later on, many other varieties were developed. Kotowaza Karuta contained traditional proverbs. Here are some bilingual karuta made in the mid 19th century for studying English. Kyodo karata are based on local history and places. Karata spread rapidly as an educational tool for children and became part of everyday life in Japan. <laughs> Japanese karata arose from the fusion of Western playing cards and Japan's own traditions and developed into a unique way of providing entertainment and education at the same time. Iroha karuta come in many different types and we have a few of them laid out here. These are proverbs from the Edo period. These are little tips for cooking. And over here we have bilingual facts pertaining to Gumma Prefecture, which is an area in Japan a little north of Tokyo. Now, over here are some fairly interesting ones. These all relate to fish, and they're a copy of a set that was originally made up in 1936 at the Tsukiji Fish Market. People who work at the market these days learned about fish from looking at these cards when they were children, playing with them as well. Here's one for he. Uh, which stands for hirame, which is a kind of flatfish. And the accompanying card here tells you that uh, hirame have two eyes, both on the left-hand side. And here we have some more recent ones. These are, I suppose, eco karta. They all deal with environmental issues. And this one here is so, which stands for solar. And the accompanying card tells you that if you put solar panels up on your roof, you can generate your own electricity. So it's kind of a lesson in green energy.
So with all of these things, you can play card games and learn about stuff at the same time. Karta is also what could probably only de be described as an intellectual sport. Let's take a look now at some very serious competitors. <laughs> Competing to touch a torifuda in the blink of an eye is the basis of competitive karuta. It demands an excellent memory and sharp reflexes. Hundredths of a second make the difference between victory and defeat. It's been called a martial art on tatami. Competitive karuta has been going on for about 100 years. Today it's played by more than a million people in Japan. Let's see how these karuta contests work. Usually a match is between just two players. The karuta used are Ogura Hyakunin Ishu. First, each player picks up 25 of the 100 cards in the set at random. Then they're arranged in three lines of up to 16 cards. You have to think which spots will be easy for you to reach and hard for your opponent. You can read your own cards easily, but from your viewpoint, your opponent's cards are upside down. Once the cards are laid out, the competitors have 15 minutes to memorize their positions. Then when the 15 minutes are up, you bow to your opponent and to the reciter, and the game begins. As the first part of a poem is read, you must try to be the first to touch the card with the second part on it. There's a trick to getting at the right card quickly. You have to recognize the critical syllable. For example, three out of the 100 poems start with the syllable he. As soon as the reciter gets as far as hi sa, it can only be one card, so you can reach for it. But if the second syllable is to, making hi to, then the third syllable is the critical one. It could be mo or wa. The winner is the first person to get rid of all of his or her cards. If you manage to remove one of your opponent's cards, your opponent has to receive one of your cards to take its place. And the key to winning the game is to instantly recognize and react to critical syllables more quickly than your opponent does. Every January there are matches to determine the top men's and women's character players in Japan. The previous year's champion has a title match with a challenger who has come through the qualifying rounds. The competition is intense. Victory is decided by hundredths of a second. Here in the women's division, second year university student Saki Kusunoki is going for her sixth consecutive title. When she was 15, Kusunoki became the youngest national champion in history. She has remained undefeated ever since. Kusunoki started competing in karata when she was in her third year of primary school. She joined a local karata club. A month later, she took part in a tournament in her home prefecture of Oita. And even though it was her first event, she won it. Her father, Makoto, saw her potential and began practicing karata with her every day. <laughs> Wow, you're amazing today. Makoto has developed unique training methods for his daughter. He draws straight lines on the mat. They indicate the shortest path the hand can follow to reach distant cards.
Kusunoki practices these motions over and over until they're second nature. In competition, the opponent's hand is in motion too. So players reach out to the cards by blocking with the knuckles of the hand and flick the cards with the fingertips. This exercise builds memory power. After she memorizes the positions of the cards, her father hides them. She has to recall instantly where each one was located. In another exercise, a transparent mat is laid over the torifuda. Then they're hidden by other cards placed on top. This gets her to practice reacting just by memory and automatic reflex, rather than by sight. Thanks to her father's training, Kusunoki has become a powerhouse. The match is drawing to a close. Kusunoki needs just one more card to clinch victory. She concentrates on the reciter's voice. Kusunoki defeats her opponent to claim her sixth consecutive title. With her father's help, once again she has become Japan's number one karata player. We practice together. My family, we're a team. We're the team Kusunoki. I'm just so happy that I won this championship as a result of our team effort. Japanese karata can be enjoyed in lots of different ways. Not just as an elegant pastime, but also in a fiercely competitive fashion. There are many, many different types of card games around the world, but to take painting and classical poetry and then add an educational element to it and evolve the whole thing into a competitive game is pretty unusual. It also gives you a good insight into the Japanese penchant for taking a concept in one form and then revamping it into something completely different. Karada have been around for centuries now. Of course, most Japanese kids these days get their pleasure out of playing video games. But as we saw in the video just now, the girl who's the current karata champion started when she was very little. And in most Japanese primary schools, they do teach at least the basics of karata. So one can only hope that future generations of Japanese children will continue to produce karata champions. I'll see you again next time. Next time on Begin Japanology, we look at taiko drums, the heartbeat of the nation.